Uh, I'm Ned. I work with Sam Staten down at the other Wilson named building. Uh, and uh, I'm a PhD student. And I'm going to be talking to you today through our paper, Quantum Definetti Theorems as Categorical Limits and Co Limits of C star algebras. Uh, the kind of primary result here is a synthesis of a, a few different things uh, kind of coming together for a, for a categorical version of this quite. Um, this original theorem. So uh, we've got a little bit of a map of some stuff we're going to run through uh, in order to bring it all together uh, at the end. Um, so first off, uh, we're going to have a little chat about um, Definetti theorems and what they mean. These are theorems that sort of discuss exchangeable processes. So we're going to talk about what exchangeability means, um, the kind of constraint that is, and, uh, and what ends up happening when we, when we talk about exchangeable processes. And that's what the Definetti theorems tend to, to describe. Um, and we're going to realize that in order to describe the quantum Definetti theorem meaningfully uh, in a categorical context, we're going to need uh, a slightly different set of tools. Um, uh, that is, we're going to need C-star algebras, because they're going to be the place where we can kind of bring together uh, the classical probability and the quantum uh, randomness that uh, are so relevant here. Uh, I think that part might be a, a bit of a recap for some of you, but I think it would be good to kind of put that together so that we have all the tools available. Um, and then once we've kind of built all of that stuff up, we're going to run on through, package it all together, um, and, and see what we can kind of pop out at the other end. If we're lucky, we'll also get to chat very briefly about the one that we get for free off the end of it, which is a categorical version of the classical Definetti theorem. Um, but we'll see how we are for time. Um, so let's jump right in onto Definetti theorems in general. Exchangeability is a, originally um, a condition on normal classic, classical probabilistic processes. This is a quintessential version of an exchangeable event. Exchangeability means that our results are independent of the order that we get them in. So we can see here that this process, where we've got a bag of coins, one of them's fair, one of them only flips heads, one of them only flips tails, um, and then we pick a coin from the bag, and then we just flip it forever. So this is a way of creating a list of, uh, of heads and tails results um, that doesn't care what the order of those results are. So heads and tails, we can see here, it doesn't matter if we get heads, then tails, or tails, then heads. Um, heads, 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 all this kind of stuff. Now, the interesting thing about this process, because we've got this two step, these two steps of, uh, of randomness, um, our flips aren't quite independent. Right? Like if we see three heads in a row, we know we definitely don't have the tails coin. And so we should use that information to deduce something about what's going on next and what we're more likely to see going forwards. Um, if we were to replace our heads only coins with a heads biased coin and our tails only coins with a tails biased coin, then we wouldn't be so concrete about what we can deduce based on a heads, heads, heads uh, set of results but it should be a way of inferring information about future flips. So what we have is something that's not quite independent, but it is independent, conditioning on this one original random choice. So Definetti's theorem, the original form of it, the classical form, says that every exchangeable sequence has this kind of like weak independence thing. We're independent as long as we have dealt with the original source of randomness. And he originally introduced it. I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going to go into too much of the philosophy. But he introduced it as a, as a way of kind of uh, making his uh, subjectivist uh, kind of uh, probability uh, possible to infer information about the future, because he didn't like the idea of independent and identical random variables. Um, but it's a more general thing than that. And we can just say that if we know something's exchangeable, we have this sort of weak independence property. The bag of coins is a sort of prototypical example of this because we've created it from a single random choice and then a bunch of random things. But most exchangeable processes don't look like this. And so a good example of an exchangeable process that doesn't appear to be like picking a coin from a bag to start with is Polyazern. The Polyazern don't. I was quite proud of this diagram that I did. And I didn't want to have to draw an urn as well as a barrel. So they're not related. Just. Um, this is an urn. It's completely separate from the bag. Um, so in Polya's urn, we start off with, a, with an urn full of black and white balls. We've got n white balls and k black balls. And we generate results by picking from the bag 
recording the color of the ball. So in the first one over here, we've picked a white ball. And then we return two of the same color. So the rich get richer. Um, this is an exchangeable process, so it's not at least uh, immediately clear until you think about it a little bit. Um, and so there's got to be this kind of bag of coins going on in the background. Since our only outcomes are white and black balls, our coin's going to have one white side and one black side. And it turns out that all we're doing is we're drawing a bias from a beta distribution, and that then is the seed for all the rest of the stuff we're doing. It's going to be hidden from us when we're doing the experiment. It's not, well, it's sort of, um, I don't know, some kind of uh, construct within the, within the experiment. But um, this sort of encodes the idea that, well, if we pick out a bunch of white balls, then it kind of inclines us towards greater bias in the future. But this is not really dependent on when we pick out all those white balls and how that operates. Um, so this is classical exchangeability. Uh, Diffinetti's theorem kind of puts it to bed and says, look, exchangeability is as good as this other thing. It's actually equivalent to this other thing that we have. On the quantum side of things, we have a very similar thing. We're now imagining instead of a bag of coins, a bag of states. We'll pick one state out of the bag, and then we'll use it to create a bunch of uh, unentangled um, things. And we can then measure from there. In the same way, we have this sort of initial step of randomness and then another step of randomness, but now they're not, it's not classical both times. It's classical and then it's quantum. So though we don't have entanglement, we still seem to infer something about our states based on, um, on our observations. So the quantum Definetti theorem says that an exchangeable sequence of states in a very similar way is like drawing from a bag. We have a measure over single states, and then we just take a product of all of them, of, the, of it with itself over and over and over again, separately. Another way of thinking about this is through circuit diagrams. Here's two examples of some exchangeable circuits. Um, the first one we can see the, relies entirely on the classical probability, the classical randomness. We have a certain result at each one of those wires, but it's dependent either on what happens at the beginning, it depends on what happens at the beginning, and then all the rest are the same from that point onwards. On the other hand, the diagram on the right hand side has quantum randomness at every stage. We've got a mixed state for each of those things, and they're completely disconnected from each other. But they've all got the same mixed state, the same density matrix. Um, we can see it's exchangeable because we can swap over the wires, and we're going to get exactly the same thing coming out the other end, and the same on this one. Um, there's a similar kind of philosophical approach on this thing as well, where um, I think the work is from Caves and Fuchs and Schack over here is about uh, Bayesianism in, in quantum stuff um, and saying if we take the approach that states are some kind of subjective thing, then this gives us the same power to infer future things by making an easier assumption than complete separability. Um, all right, so that's, that's sort of those... Um, things, but now we need to move a little bit onto the sketch of where we're going to go with the talk and how we're going to end up kind of putting this all together. Um, as actually happened on the previous slides, we weren't really ever talking about a state on any kind of infinite thing. We were just looking at states that could be extended indefinitely. It's the same in the classical case. We never looked at infinitely long chains of coin flips. We just looked at coin flips that we could keep going and know that at every stage we'd have this kind of permutation invariance. So when we talk about the sequence of states and in what comes next, we're going to really be talking about um, states that are on incremental uh, tensor products of uh, a Hilbert space with itself. Now, we also need to ask that it's compatible so that we know that we are kind of adding on to what we were doing before rather than just creating something entirely new. And so that's the way that we, uh, we deal with this thing. And so, again, in the wire diagrams, it's quite an easy thing to see that if we just discard this last wire, we end up with the thing from before. And so we know that we're building things up incrementally. We then want to start putting this into a sort of graphical thing. And in the end, we're going to be using uh, a particular category to, to put all our results in. But let's just begin like this. Um, if we recall that uh, a state or a density matrix on a Hilbert space is just a quantum channel from C to it, um, we can see that a compatible sequence can be given by a diagram like this, where we pick out a density matrix in each one of those tensor products. And we ask that if we move from C, picking out uh, a state in H3, and then we trace down to H2, we're going to keep, we, it's going to be the same as just, oh, sorry, just picking um, that second uh, state in the first place. 
How do we include exchangeable sequences in here? Well, what does it mean for the sequence to be exchangeable? It says that if we permute any of those Hilbert space factors, then we're also going to end up with the same thing again. So all we're going to have to do is add in a bunch more of those maps. All of these things from H3 to itself are just permutations of the different Hs. And the maps between them are now different ways of dropping one of those Hs. So, um, yeah, so this is sort of, I think, a, a fairly um, standard way of start thinking about a categorical version of exchangeability. Um, but now we're doing it in a quantum setting. Uh, and there's some interesting stuff that will come from that in a second. So what's the result? Well, the result says that there's this, this object, QDFH, this thing that kind of uniquely uh, determines um, something about exchangeable sequences. This QDFH has the property that if we parameterize a state, so now we're no longer just using C down here, we're using this, this K, which is a, a parameter, um, so we're kind of looking in a wider categorical sense. We're using a general object rather than just the, the final one. Um, we uh, will get this unique map that goes between here. And this property uniquely determines QDFH as well. So in the same way as we have universal properties that will uniquely determine a tensor product or a product, we now have a, a unique way of um, talking about this thing. And um, our little taster of quantum definetti at the beginning suggests that this thing over here should probably be kind of uh, uniquely determining uh, distributions on states. Now, the trouble then is that this, that, that QDFH is a kind of classical object. As we said, there's this interesting two-step process where we have a classical thing and then a quantum thing. And so we no longer can really live in this space where I, I'm afraid I might have missed out saying this, that all these arrows are quantum channels. Um, we can't really live in this space where we're looking at quantum channels here because this thing is in a Hilbert space, and so there's no kind of meaningful way of talking about that. And so this is how we extend ourselves a little bit because we need to now look at somewhere where we also can have maps that put classical information across them, these channels. Um, so this kind of finishes us on the, on the, I don't know, aesthetic preview of De Finetti theorems and moves us on to the next stage, which is developing some tools where we can put together these, these classical and quantum things. As I said, this might be a bit of a review for some of you, um, might be familiar content. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I think we should introduce C-star algebras um, and their state spaces, because that's going to be a really integral point in, uh, in the final proof of, of the categorical quantum definetti theorem. So before we get there, we should talk quickly about what we mean when we talk about measures. Um, we're not going to go into too much nasty measure theory. We're going to be doing everything on topological spaces. We're going to be doing everything on compact Hausdorff topological spaces, so spaces where you can't run away to infinity and where all your points are nicely separated. We'll see that that is exactly the right kind of choice of space because it means that uh, we'll be able to move back and forth between classical, normal kind of uh, measure stuff and um, working on C star algebras. Um, we also then only care about probability measures, Borel probability measures, um, which are radon, which means that they are built up by what they do on compact sets. So um, compactness in all of this is clearly a very important thing. I mean, it's also relevant when we look at those sequences. We never, never looked at the full infinite sequences. We were only looking at these um, compact finite subsets of them. Um, and so whenever we talk about a measure going forward, when we talk about a Radon measure, this is what we should have in mind. We should have something that, does, that has these properties that works on a compact space um, and only cares about the compact subsets of that space. And then where we're heading in our discussion of C-star algebras is towards states, because states on a C-star algebra will be this uniting thing that tells us that we can both talk about density matrices or, or normal quantum theory stuff and also can talk about Radon measures. And in that case, we'll have them in the same language We'll have them in the same category, and consequently, we can kind of situate our result amongst all of this. So just a quick review, a C-star algebra, it's a Banach star algebra over C with a C with the C-star identity. So we've got a complete normed vector space with an involution and a multiplication, and this condition that means that the algebraic properties line up with the analytic ones. Um, obvious example of this is going to be BH with a joints and composition. Um, and then another one, which is maybe slightly less obvious, but will be just as important in a second, and the reason, again, why we like these compact house or spaces. So now we can look at um, the space of all continuous maps um, 
to see complex value continuous maps on this space compact household space X. Um, and then we're going to do everything else point wise. And this one's interesting because it's commutative versus the previous one, which is most of the time very much not commutative. Um, and uh, in fact, all commutative C star algebras are isomorphic to CX for some compact household space X. This goes further, which we'll see in a sec, because um, once we start thinking about the maps um, on C star algebras, the obvious thing to do to begin with, we're always going to be looking at linear maps. Everything is vector spaces. Everything should be linear. Um, but one option for what we can do here is we can ask that it preserves all the other qualities as well. And if that's the case, then we see that there is a use to these things. They um, extend that correspondence between uh, compact house store spaces and um, C star algebras to duality of categories. So um, these kind of uh, star homomorphisms correspond to continuous maps on, on the other side over here. And we get this, this nice duality between an algebraic category and, um, well, and a spatial one. Um, however, we might want to be a little bit more flexible. We might ask that instead of um, star homomorphisms, of which there aren't that many, um, if we were to define states, which we'll do in a second, which are maps from the space into C with star homomorphisms, a bunch of very, very simple spaces have no states at all. In fact, most of the matrix algebra uh, uh, spaces don't. So instead, we also want to think about this thing because uh, a positive element is such that there is this sort of square rooting like thing. Um, and uh, this is sort of a way for us to bring in that, that idea of, um, uh, I guess, self adjoint elements and, and all this kind of stuff that we, we want when we talk about density matrices normally. Um, so positive elements in C are the, the non-negative reals. In CX, we've got everything that just maps directly into the non-negative reals. And then we have these kind of positive maps in um, BH as well. And then a, a positive map between C star algebras just maps positive elements to positive elements. Um, completely positive maps, which is actually really what's more important to us, are just positive maps that stay positive when we tensor things together. Um, because we want to be able to, you know, adjoin states and put things alongside each other. So yeah, quantum channels are just completely positive unital maps here. The unital is doing the work of trace preserving. That's what this means. So now we're in the position to kind of put together these bits and pieces that we have. Um, positive unital maps into C are states for a space A. And we have this nice thing that we can actually give a topology to the space, the set of uh, states. And with that topology, we get out that it's compact and it's Hausdorff, which is, you know, shows that we're kind of moving between categories in a fairly fluid manner now. Um, in fact, there's an additional structure which will become relevant later, which is that we can also combine states in a convex manner. Um, and so this space isn't just compact and Hausdorff, it also has a convex structure. Um, density matrices are states. If we take a density matrix, we can define this operator on BH, this sort of functional. And uh, the unital trace of a density matrix gives us that this is a unital map. And um, I haven't done the technical part of this, but the fact that your spectrum is positive gives that, the, that this map, this um, functional, is a positive map. If H is finite dimensional, then this is all of the states. But in infinite dimensions, there are other ones. On the other hand, Radon measures also occur as states. We can see, we, from a Radon measure, we can define a state via integration, which again, we can see as unital because it's a probability measure, and it's positive because it's a non-negative uh, measure, real measure. And all states now, on any CX, are of this form. And so we end up with this uh, nice way of talking about measure without going into sigma algebras or anything like this, um, purely through the kind of relationship between these categories uh, and this sort of new algebraic duality that we've got. Since we've extended our category, we've not, we don't just have star homomorphisms anymore. We've enlarged with uh, adding on these kind of more flexible maps. It's a reasonable question to ask whether CH also can be kind of extended, enlarged, by adding some extra maps so that the duality continues to hold. And um, 
due to a lovely paper by Ferber and Jacobs in 2015, you absolutely can. And the process of kind of loosening up these, these, uh, these maps, these positive maps, is exactly like adding stochastic uh, probability, let's say, um, to my, uh, my category of compact house store spaces. In fact, it's even better than that. It's about, turning, about taking the Kleisley category of a monad on CH. The monad R is the Rada monad. It takes a space to the space of measures on it. Um, with uh, Similarly, as we saw, we could give uh, a topology as this state of CH, CX, so we just give it the topology from that. And it works out, as we saw, to be compact in Hausdorff. And it's all very nice. Things in Kleiser category of R, the objects are just the spaces, but the maps now have an element of stochasticness to them. We can take an element X, and it's going to go somewhere in Y by some probability distribution. We just need to ask that there's, um, there's some continuousness in all of that. And so we get this, this probabilistic Gelfand duality, which says that exactly this. Extending with, pro with positive maps is the same as adding a layer of probability to um, compact house door spaces. The paper also has a couple of other very nice results, which are going to situate what we eventually talk about here. It says that the category of Eilenberg Moore algebras of the Rada monad is equivalent to this conv CH thing that we have here. The objects of conv CH are what we said that uh, the state spaces were. They are compact and Hausdorff, as we'd expect. But they've also got this additional thing of being convex. So if I take it two states, I can combine them in proportions that add up to one, and um, they stay uh, within the state space. There's something quite nice about this, because this seems to say that then um, this is like a, the algebras, the, the non-free algebras, so the algebras that live in here in, in MR but don't live in the Kleise category, a kind of a categorical quotient of probability spaces. And so the fact that we can put states in here says that state spaces are kind of like quotienting out regular probability, classical probability spaces. Um, interestingly, this state space functor is full and faithful, which means that you know, this, this structure is nice. It, it plays nicely with what we'd expect. But it's not uh, an equivalence. So there are quotients of probability spaces, of, of classical probability spaces, that don't occur as state spaces for, uh, for some C star algebra. Um, and there's some interesting questions there about you know, what allows something to occur in quantum scenarios. This kind of sets us up quite nicely. We've finished our tour of the original theorems. We've also now built up some tools. We understand that the state space functor might be helpful in what we're doing here. Um, and so our next step is to put it all together into this, this last theorem that we have. As just a quick recap, we remember that we were originally talking about states like these kind of diagrams, these, uh, these consistent diagrams, where we pick out states on Hilbert spaces and then pass them down the line. Um, when we transfer into that sort of uh, C star algebra place, we're going to reverse those arrows. So when we talked about completely positive maps earlier, we flipped the arrows around because Actually, when we, we talk about H up here, we're really talking about BH. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a flipping of the arrows. There's an opping that goes on here. So now, when we think of an exchangeable sequence of states, we should be imagining this sort of diagram. We're taking tensor products of these C star algebras. Um, we're taking spatial tensor products, uh, because they're the ones that correspond with that kind of like Hilbert spacey feel. Um, and then we're going to map them down into C like this. And so when we extend, what we're going to do instead, when we parameterize, is we're now mapping into a general C star algebra, this K over here. So our result, this categorical quantum Diffinetti theorem, tells us that the limit, or the co-limit, sorry, of this diagram with permutations and injections in C star CPU is going to be this object, CSA, which, when we apply the state space functor to it, is just going to become R. S of A, so measures on states of A, which is exactly what we hoped for at the beginning, which is what it was going for. And so we have this unique determining of the, um, of the, the measures on SA. Um, 
And then for any exchangeable sequence parameterized by k, we map directly into it. So it's like saying if we parameterize an um, a exchangeable sequence, we might as well just be parameterizing a, parameterizing a measure, which is a, a simpler task. The proof for this takes place in this kind of tapestry of categories over here. Um, for a moment, this is going to look quite complicated, but we're going to talk through what happens because we follow some arrows around playing with li limits and constructing stuff in different places and then bring them all back to where we want to be, which is eventually in C star CPU up the top here. So the proof, we begin in C star PU, that's where we situate this diagram to begin with, and we're going to move it down into this Island Bone More category because it turns out this is a nicer place to play with the result. Once we're here, what we have is that the original Definetti theorem the non-parameterized, non-categorical version allows us to construct things point-wise, right? If I parameterized, I can just take each point in my parameter space and build the measure for that point. The trouble about making this categorical is we need to make sure that when we build up this, this map, it plays nicely in whatever category we're interested in. So if we're in EMR, we're building up a map that's going to be affine and continuous. If we're in C star PU, so we've kind of gone a level up, we've uh, removed our states again, we're going to want something that's positive. And so we move all the way down this line, down these u dash and u to set. u over here is the monadic forgetful functor on compact house door spaces. u dash is the monadic forgetful functor from this Ironberg Moore category down to ch, where the monad takes place. And so by passing us down the way, we can construct this setwise, this pointwise um, limit in set, this function, and then we can pass it back up again across those monadic functors which create limits, both in CH and then up in EMR. Once we've created our limit in EMR, then we can pass it back up to C star PU, well, op, because Fully faithful functors reflect limits, and as we saw from that paper earlier, the state space functor is fully faithful. Finally, the limit is commutative, it's CSA, and any map into or out of a commutative C star algebra is going to be completely positive. So since the diagram maps and the, the limiting maps are all going to be CPU, we can then pass back up to C star CPU op and show that this is, in fact, the limit there, or the co-limit in the, in the unopt category. Um, the reason why I put this kind of diagram up for us is because uh, the kind of overall thought with this, this work and the hope for the future is that there's kind of something interesting about this graph of categories. And this KLR, the fact that we've got this monad that gives rise to a bunch of the extra structure, but as algebras, as non-free algebras rather than the free algebras, um, sort of puts it amongst a bunch of other interesting categorical probability. Because, for example, KLR is a Markov category, which is a way of doing categorical probability. Um, and I'm interested in reconciling maybe some of the ways that we do categorical probability with the ways we do categorical quantum probability. Um, because if we can construct, for example, the, the non-free algebras from this Markov category, then we'll be able to do quantum -y things alongside. I think this is sort of, um, yeah, uh, there's some work by Arthur Parzignat on uh, quantum Markov categories. There's other stuff around this kind of, in, in the space of quantum, um, uh, categorical quantum stuff. But this is sort of what I'm trying to think about. And so just kind of to bring us, bring us back to what the, the main result here is, so that when we have this, uh, this diagram, we can create this, this limit, and this, this causes, we, we kind of create this um, parametric and categorical form of, of the quantum Definetti theorem. Um, to sort of give us something to, to finish on, the nice, I uh, think a nice way of thinking about this is to say that um, it also allows us now to start thinking about these circuits like we did at the beginning, but instead of, um, instead of with a strict kind of um, set of inputted qubits, because we now have this compositional property, we can input 
something else. We can input a previous system, some other system, and we know that this is going to keep operating. It's going to just start, as we said, parameterizing that measure in this thing. Um, all right. I think I've actually run quite quick, <laughs> um, which leaves us a bit of time for questions. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the result. Thank you for the talk. Questions? Uh, thanks for the excellent talk. Um, so you said there is like a previous result on a quantum Definetti theorem. Um, did this already hold for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces or just Caesar algebras? Because I'm, I'm wondering, is apart from presenting in a categorical way, have you also shown it holds for more general spaces? Or was it already known that this essentially works for any Caesar algebra? So yeah, the original statement was for all Caesar algebras. Yeah, that's the idea. There are also alternative forms for other things, W star algebras and all this kind of stuff that kind of exist and, and might fit nicely into this sort of formulation as well. Um, but yeah, we've kind of got it for all of those things to start with. Okay, so thank you for the talk. It was very, very interesting, very nice. Uh, maybe a very naive question. If I understand well your proof, it really relies on the classical definity theorem. Well, you come back to the... Um, maybe I'm absolutely not understanding anything. But, so you come back to set and CH to use a non-quantum yeah. non version, right? Yeah, yeah. And then it seems that you really just lift it. So, in fact... Um, no, we don't. It's the, we're not constructing the classical version in set and CH. Um, we're constructing the the quantum version, but with things just as spaces, without this kind of like affine structure. So when when we get to to this point, uh, and we take the state spaces of everything in this diagram, they're all going to be compact Hausdorff spaces alongside this structure as state spaces. And so, the, yeah, I, I don't. I think it's more meaningfully interpreted in that in that EMR space. When we do it classically, what happens, this was the part I was hoping we might be able to touch on quickly, is just that if we if we replace all those spaces with with commutative C star algebras, then this is the classical version. And that then holds um, in well in basically all of these um, these spaces along the bottom here. So what we end up with instead is this thing where everything is states is, we've got states and all of this is what's happening in CH and set. Um, we're just sort of abandoning structure. And then, in fact, something that I forgot to mention or maybe didn't emphasize is that the fact that we can build back up with those monadic functors says that that continuous, the kind of topology on state spaces, the affine structure on state spaces uh, builds up kind of on itself. Like there's, there's, normally, we'd expect that from things like uh, categories of algebraic objects. So if we're taking limits of groups, we don't need to worry about putting the operations on it. There's just a natural way to do it, and that works. Normally, though, when we work with, for example, measure spaces, it doesn't work as nicely as that. And most topologicals are the topological spaces either, because we can make different choices of topology and measure. And so what we end up with is this diagram of these kind of sets only in set and in CH. And then we can kind of, yeah, we do lift it, exactly. But the kind of more important part, I guess, is that all of the maps that we'd hope to be continuous and affine turn out to be continuous and affine because of this categorical structure. So then my question is, where do you think is the quantum part? Because you see, you, you come back to a completely probabilistic setting. If I you know you just have host of spaces. And for me, the quantum has been lost somewhere. And I do have an intuition. So what is the what yeah. quantum? Well, so I guess something that's interesting about the, the quantum definition theorem in itself is that it doesn't immediately make any statement about classical things and they emerge kind of like on their own. And so uh, you're right, to a certain extent, what's happened is that the quantumness has 
evaporated into thin air and become this classical problem. But what we thought was a very, very big system of quantum things that might be interacting with each other, exchangeability is actually a really strict requirement. And it enforces that we end up back with something classical. But that's, I guess, why it's interesting to me in, in this, this picture, because there's something to be said then about what sort of quantum situations give rise to classical effects, force these kind of classical maps to, bring about, to come about. Because no, I, I mean, I agree, there's something, maybe, I don't know, unsatisfying about not getting something more complicated out, but then there's also something kind of interesting that we end up with this. Oh, you just pick something for a bag and then keep on going, why not? Easy, you know? Thank you. Well, since we have time, let me ask a follow-up, um, and I'll, I'll get to the rest. So, in this scenario where you, you bootstrap it so that you get classical behavior, is the quantum system that is producing this behavior easy to simulate classically? Or are we not even... Can we, can we even say something about this? Uh, I am not sure. I mean, so it... Mm. Yeah, I'm not really certain. Maybe we can chat about that afterwards. Okay. Okay, we have one, Stefano and Dominic, right? Okay. I think this depends on which properties you're interested in. So, for example, if you look at finite systems, they can have the property of exchangeability in the thermodynamic limit. So, if you will take the thermodynamic limit, you will have a classical description, as in this situation. But um, this does not mean that you cannot use precisely this quantum system as a finite system to uh, produce highly entangled states or do quantum computation, have quantum advantage, and so on. Thanks. Dom? Uh, there's a kind of extension of the quantum definity theorem that says if you've got an exchangeable state on n systems, it sort of becomes arbitrarily close to a product state as n increases. Can you say anything about that? I think that's just... Um, it's sort of truncating this limiting property. Um, so, yeah, I, I've seen that before as well, but I think that's just to say that, yeah, if we can, this is the limiting case where we can extend things indefinitely, and so we can take it as, as high an end as possible, and so we get arbitrarily close, and in the limit we end up with something that's completely exchangeable and all ends. Okay, so could you have, could you like, uh, could you get a sort of a bound on like the distance in, in norm between the, exchangeable state and a product state could you could you make a statement like that using this sort of technology well so um i've had some interesting conversations with with people in the department on this kind of topic because there's similar things to be said in categories of um normal probability where we're looking at convergence and kind of putting in these these limits um i think maybe if we do some kind of enrichment that might be worthwhile but I, it's it's in, a, in an early stage okay. um but yeah I, I was actually if you want to talk to me later i was in a conversation with someone about basically exactly this so um Great. yeah we can, I can connect you we can chat about just a, a quick question uh, if you go to slide 21 please oh, oh that one yeah that one I skip the number oh. yep <laughs> So uh, the construction that you have on the top is concrete. You have uh, states specifically, but at the bottom you depict them as um, as diagrams. So is, is there some feedback on this? Can you reduce the feedback? It's closer. closer, okay. Oh, yeah, can I hear that again? Uh, so the, the, concrete, the, the limit that you take is on, on concrete states, but at the bottom you represent them as diagrams. So there's a question as to does this limiting construction extend to the diagrams themselves? So you can think of the diagrams and interpret them into your algebras and they give you states. Well, these, these diagrams, yes. the, the circuit diagrams? Yeah, the circuit diagrams. Or any other kind of diagrammatic presentation. Yeah, I, I think there's a very reasonable movement from here to here. Um, in the paper, this, this part was more um, Sam than, than me, but um, the, the, this is kind of a yeah, there's a very easy way to transition from this into putting kind of B 
B of C of N times N up here, and then it all kind of it checks out very nicely. But this is kind of like a, a fairly easy toy example, and so it doesn't need, you know, if we, if we put it up there, it might be overkill. We can kind of see what the answer is for this particular example. But yeah, if we have a diagrammatic presentation, then we no, should be able to. No, but the question is, once you take the limit, can you lift the limit back to the diagrams? Oh, I see. Can you make the diagrams into an algebraic or algebraic object that encapsulates this entire sequence by oh. sort of lifting the limit up? Oh, interesting. Um, I haven't given any thought to that, but uh, yeah, it might be a, an interesting route of inquiry. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right, thank you. Um, maybe a naive question, but like, what kind of limits exist in the category of Caesar algebra? Like, if you just have this diagram on top, could you be able to say this thing definitely does have a limit or co-limit? Uh, just based on the fact of the shape of the of the diagram, and then the the content of the theorem is kind of like this is what the exact limit looks like. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think a fair amount of of so, well, so so when we look at uh, the C star MIU ones, there's I think there's a lot more clarity. Um, uh, admittedly, I, I don't think I know in detail about this one, but my my belief is that our understanding of like probabilistic limits isn't so strong. So when we're looking at, you know, the closer category of R, there's there's some questions to be made there. And so uh, naturally, when we're kind of in C star PU, um, which is sort of a more complicated level, there's there's definitely some ambiguity about what exists in that. Um, the reason why we we kind of know that this one exists is because we can put it into um, into into EMR. But there is something to be said for the fact that um, uh, the limit in EMR is a state itself, and that means that we can reflect back over. Uh, no, I'm not. I have some thoughts on it, but nothing that I'm kind of um, confident enough in to 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 put on the record. <laughs> Yeah, reg regarding the co-limits, I think that in uh, C star mu, you have, uh, I mean, it's complete and co-complete, so there you have everything. But also here, you're taking very specific maps anyway, so you might actually be just computing the limit there. No, it's not, it's not there. It's not there? Ah, okay. 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 All right. Thanks again, the speaker.